Well, if you turn to the book of Ephesians chapter 4, I'm only going to look at chapter 4, the first six verses this morning, and we're going to talk about shoe leather Christianity, walking it out, because it doesn't matter how high your head goes into the clouds if you can't walk it out. Amen? And Paul in the book of Ephesians, which is just absolutely one of my favorite books in the whole Bible, and you take a sentence in Ephesians and you could talk on it for weeks. Uh, it's such a, a deep book. But in the first three chapters, a lot of what the first three chapters are about are just very superfluous, very high, very uh, exalted tones of what this resurrected life is about. And then he comes to chapter 4, verse 1, and he says, did you like that? Now it's time to get practical. Now it's time to get real. <laughs> How many of you know that's when most people leave the church right there? But I know that you're not going to leave because I know that God's going to speak to your hearts as uh, we grasp on onto the word. But Paul takes it from talk to walk right here in chapter four. It becomes a walk. And I counted, it depends on the translation, but I counted at least four times where Paul uses the analogy of walking here in the next couple chapters, walking it out, putting shoe leather to it, step by step in daily, everyday living, living out the resurrection power, letting it out of us in, in, in daily life. And walking is such a powerful analogy. I came, you know, everybody walks, uh, unless they're disabled, they walk. And uh, we use the analogy of walking for so many things, and it's so simple to understand. And, and I came across on the internet uh, that there's a website called Walking Stories. I just typed in Walking Stories, and this website pops up. And it's like this worldwide club of people that walk all over the world and they just share their stories and anyone can share walking stories and there's just tons of stories on there and like if you're going to go walk in a certain you know you're going to go walk in South Africa or in Oregon or wherever you can go on there and there are probably people that have shared stories of their walks of what you know what the scenery's like and good routes to take and everything from that to simpler things but but you know everybody walks and there's one story on there of a couple named Paul and Barbie, who they just one day uh, were in Idaho and they decided, hey, we want to walk to Florida. <laughs> no joke. And, th and so they, they, in part, blogged their story where what they would do, they said, we're not in a hurry. On the opposite, we want to just take our time and enjoy the walk. And they just literally got up one morning and started walking in Idaho to Florida. And what they would do was they would stop at a town, you know, they'd have to somewhat plan it out to know where they were going to end up, but they would stop at a town that they thought was nice, and they'd say, well, we're going to get jobs here, and they would get jobs, and they would work for a while until they got tired, and then they'd get up one morning, and they'd just walk out of town to the next place. Wouldn't that be an exciting way to go? <laughs> some, of, some of the women are cringing. You know, you're afraid of your husband to uh, sell the house and, and buy, an, and buy a, a camper, <laughs> you know, let alone just get up and walk one day. But, but there are people that do that. Uh, you can go to the next slide if you would, uh, men. One of the most amazing walking stories that we've all heard uh, is Arthur Blessed. You know that guy, right? He's the guy that carried the cross around. And the Holy Spirit just brought him to mind, and I went to his website and this is actually the 50th year of him walking with the cross in 2018. And I want to read you the quote off of, off of his intro on his website because it's kind of neat. So listen, listen to the Arthur Blessed, which the Guinness Book of World Records classifies him as having the longest walk ever that they've recorded. So the longest walk, this is the 50th year of me carrying the cross around the world to every nation from 1968 until 2018. The Guinness Book of World Records has listed me, Arthur Blessed, for the longest walk or pilgrimage on record. It's been over 42,279 miles, or 68,041 kilometers. Uh, they've walked in 324 countries and island groups and territories. 84.5 million steps have been taken, and over 19 billion pounds have been carried. But in it all, they've shared the love of Jesus and the cross and the gospel message he says, my wife has driven in front of me with supplies and has been with me in 294 countries. 
He says, I'm still walking in 2018, and we are just pilgrims. We're the donkeys lifting the cross of Jesus. May God bless you, Arthur and Denise Blessed. That's quite a walk, isn't it? To, to get up and just start carrying your cross. But we're to walk it out. We're to, we're to carry the cross. But, but as great as that analogy is of carrying the cross, it's tied together with the fact that the resurrection of Jesus Christ has happened and the same power that rose Jesus from the dead is alive in us and we can daily walk out resurrection power. We can have a miracle today. We can have a miracle every day. Miracles are not just the things that happen in the book of Acts. Miracles happen in the ordinary, everyday stuff of life. When we allow the power of the resurrection out. When we walk in the power of the resurrection. Look at what Paul says in Ephesians 4, starting in verse 1. He says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling within which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. One one God and Father of us all, who is, uh, who is above all, through all, and in all. So Paul exhorts us here to walk worthy of our calling. He says, I beseech you. Look, you've received power. Okay, you're not normal anymore. You're abnormal. You're supernatural. The power of the resurrection is in your life. The power of God, as you walk it out, will be displayed in ordinary, average, everyday life. Miracles are the new norm. They're the ordinary for us. Now, Paul, of course, is the great apostle. And that word beseech, at least that's what the King James says he says I beseech you and that seems like a strong command but it's interesting I always love going to the Greek language uh, the original language and that's the word parakleto if you've been around here for a while you've heard me mention the paraclete a few times but Paul when he says I beseech you he's saying I paracleto you I paraclete you that is the same word that Jesus used to describe the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the book of John We'll get over there later, perhaps. But Paul is saying, look, I'm not commanding you to do this like a tight-fisted apostle. I'm not lording over you, telling you to walk out the power of the resurrection in everyday life. He's saying, I'm coming alongside you to do it. I'm exhorting you. I'm strengthening you to do it. I'm beseeching you to do it. I'll hold your hand. But inevitably, there's coming a time when I can't hold your hand anymore. There's coming a time when you're going to have to continue this walk without me. That's what Paul is saying here. And he's saying, I, if, if, you'll just, if you'll just listen to what I'm telling you here, not only will you be strengthened by my exhortation, but you'll be able to exhort and strengthen one another, to hold one another's hands as you walk. Now, the, uh, this first verse here is so powerful i got to try not to get hung up on it too long. But he says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling within which you were called. Now, if you'll go to the next slide, if you would. And that word worthy there has a picture in it in the Greek. It is the picture of a scale. Okay, you see the picture if you're present in the house today of, of the scale up here, but, but if you can't see the pictures, then you can just picture the image of blind justice. We all know what blind justice is, right? The, the blindfolded lady holding the scale. Uh, we all understand that image. And that's the image that Paul has in this word worthy. Again, he's exhorting. He's not condemning. He's not commanding like a, 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 a odious, strong apostle. He is encouraging us to keep the scales balanced. He's, and th that's what this word worthy means. It's a scale, a picture of a scale. There's a balance, okay? Now, a balance does not mean that you're knocking the edge off of the power of the resurrection. The balance is saying, don't get your head so high up in the clouds that you don't walk it out in daily life. Don't have a bunch of theories that have never been tested. But I'll tell you one thing, the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ alive in you is powerful. It'll move mountains, it'll... It'll shake principalities and powers and kingdoms. It'll bring down thrones and dominions. The power of Jesus Christ in you as you walk it out every day. He says, walk worthy of the calling within which you were called. Now, th this 
This verse opens up so much to us. This is the very epicenter of the book of Ephesians. You know, if you ever wish that the preacher would just get to the heart of it, this is it right here. This is the epicenter of the entire book of Ephesians. What he's exhorting them to do. Walk worthy of your calling. Keep it balanced. And here's what is in the balancing of the scales. On the one side is God's calling. And on the other side is our walk. God calls, we walk. Or God God demands and we respond or God request and we answer God is always calling now Paul makes this so simple now I get it that it can be complicated to, you know to walk things out daily and there are complicated situations but Paul simplifies this whole matter of walking out the power of the resurrection in daily life with us he says it's as simple as when God calls you you walk God calls you walk if God's not calling, don't walk. The scale will get unbalanced. If God is calling, don't not walk because the scale will get tipped the other way. Now, God has always been calling. And as you know, this opens up this whole broad subject into the call of God. And we're only going to touch on it this morning. But the Holy Spirit took me all the way back to Genesis chapter 3. Remember that? Where, where Adam and Eve sinned and they fell out of the presence of God and and. They went and they sewed fig leaves together. That was the best idea they could come up with. And they hid in the bushes. And, you know, we, we talk about how God walked in the cool of the garden looking for them. But if you go back and if you read in Genesis 3, 9, uh, you don't have to turn there now, but you can make a note to read this. If you go back and if you read in Genesis 3, 9, you'll see that, the, that what God did when he came to the garden is he called it says, God called unto them. Now, God's not stupid. He's all-knowing and all-powerful. God knew what they had done, and God knew where they were hiding. But what God initiated with the call is his method that he would use to interact with us for all of time and eternity. God calls, we walk. God calls, we respond. God in the call was giving Adam and Eve a chance to respond. And we all know the story. They didn't respond very well, did they? But, but God covered them still. You know, he made a sacrifice for them as, as he's made a sacrifice through us through the shed blood of Jesus. But, you know, sometimes people say, well, God wants everybody to be saved. Why isn't everybody saved? Well, the simple answer to that question is that God is called, but they haven't done the walk. They haven't walked. This is central to Paul's teachings. This is central to having a worldview where we can understand what the Apostle Paul writes. But it's especially the epicenter of the book of Ephesians. That God calls and we walk. Walk worthy of the calling wherein which you were called. Now, uh, I've read a little bit of James Dobson over the years with four kids. And uh, my youngest child, Mercy, the beautiful girl that's listening on speaker here, I hope. Not feeling well today, but my beautiful youngest daughter can be a little strong-willed, I think. <laughs> I think I'm making a fair estimate to say she can be a little strong-willed. And I, I learned a, a unique trick years back from James Dobson. And he said that when you approach a strong-willed child and you open your arms and say, come here and hug me, a lot of times they'll draw back or they'll run away or they'll, they'll play with you. He said, here's how you approach a strong-willed child. You open your arms but then you take a step backwards or you lean backwards. And he said, you watch, it'll work like magic. That kid will run to your arms. Now, when I remember to do that, you guys should just watch this sometime, you know, just from the edges when I'm interacting with Mercy. You should watch this. It is truly like magic. I'll say, Mercy, come here. And she'll say, no, 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 no. Mommy, mom, mom, you know, mama. And I'm like, geez, it sounds like I beat you or something. Why are you running away from me? Other times, you know, it's like, I like it. Mercy, come here. And she runs and jumps in my lap and gives me kisses and hugs and all that stuff, right, that I want to go home right now for because it's awesome. You know, but other times, Mercy, come here. And she won't do it. You know, she's, for whatever reason, she's not in the mood or she's defiant or whatever. But if I say, Mercy, come here, and I step back, it's like, it's like magic every time. It'll work. You watch this. There's a little trick I just taught you from James Dobson. Well, did you know that sometimes you're like a strong-willed child? You knew I wasn't going to let this get off just talking about my daughter. You knew that, right? Sometimes you're like a strong-willed child. God has called, but you haven't responded. And then you say, God, why did you get so quiet? God, why did this stuff enter into my life? God, where are you at in this circumstance? And God's just standing a step back with his arms open. 
And what happens as soon as you come to your senses, you look up and you see the wide open arms of Jesus and you can run and jump up into his lap, give him hugs and kisses and be under the protection of daddy. Amen? Daddy's involved now. You see, God knows how to deal with us, but this is how we walk it out in daily life. God calls, we respond. And it doesn't always have to be weird and creepy. You know, God does sometimes challenge us with, with some strange things. You know, he speaks to us differently. A lot of you know Jim Withrow now from the well. I know he wouldn't care that I share this story. You know, he talks about one time God told him to stop and, and water a woman's lawn. And he led the woman to the, I mean, he says, how would you like to go up to a stranger's house and start watering their lawn? <laughs> I probably wouldn't, but you know, but he responded and he led the woman to the Lord because he was obedient. Now, I know he wouldn't care that I'm sharing that story because he shares it himself, but I think that maybe God spoke to him that way because he, he has a lawn care business. He has a business. You know, that's what they do. They, I could be wrong, but I think God spoke his language. God knows how to speak our language, right? God calls, we respond. A lot of, you might be shopping in the grocery store. You know, you might be like me where they, they pray, knock, knock down the price when they see you coming. You know, you're such a deal guy. You know, you might be walking in the grocery store and there have been many, this sounds silly, but there are many times I'll go and it's like, wow, the whole rack is marked down, Jesus. And you want to be a hoarder. And sometimes you do if no one, you know, if there's no one. But if there are other people, what do you do? You hear the voice of God, you take a couple maybe, and you guys want some of this stuff? And you let people, you see, God knows how to speak your language. I'm the deal guy, so that's like my language, okay? That was the analogy there, by the way, if you didn't understand it. God knows your language. God calls. We respond. That's what keeps the balance of the scales. God calls, we respond. Now, that requires a daily interaction, moment by moment interaction with God. But the good thing is, is that he's not requiring you to carry a lot of weight. He's not requiring you to carry tomorrow or to carry yesterday or to do something far beyond your abilities. Now, God does call us to do many things far beyond our abilities, but he carries the weight to do it. And the way he does it is we get from here to there with little steps. I've always said, faith isn't a leap. It's just a bunch of steps. It's a bunch of steps following God. So this, this word axios or the scale is what he means by walking worthy of your calling, where in which you were called. This is exactly what Paul is talking about here. Now the call of God, you can go on to the next slide, please. The call of God is both individual and it's universal. Uh, a lot of what Paul talks about in these first six verses is more of our universal call to the whole church. Okay, then he'll go in verses seven uh, through about I think about thirteen or fourteen. I don't think we're going to have time to get there today. But in those those next uh, verses, he'll go. It's more of an individual call, talking about being the joints and the ligaments knit together in the body of Christ. We've got an individual calls over our lives, and we've got a corporate call over our life. Okay, so how do we keep the scales balanced? As Ithaca Open Bible Church, how do we walk out the power of the resurrection in our congregation? God calls, we respond. Simple as that. We don't carry the weight of everything. We simply carry the weight of the daily call that God gives us and the things that he's revealed to us. I can't be responsible for the things that have not yet been revealed to me, but I can be responsible for the things that he's revealed to me so far. He's a merciful God, amen? So the Bible is God's universal call. The word uh, Bible in the Hebrew is actually called the mikra, the mikra, which means to read. How many of you know the Bible's called the read? <laughs> it's not called a uh, book holder, you know, where you stack it up for the other books. It's not a dust catcher. <coughs> uh, you know, it's not, not a uh, coffee table ornament that you put on when the pastor's coming by. The Bible, the Bible is a book to read. The, the name Bible in Hebrew means to read. So you say, I want to know God's call. I want to keep the scales balanced. I want to walk out. I, I want to, in the ordinary, I want to live extraordinary. I want to see God's miracles. I hear about these healings. I hear about these financial testimonies. I hear about these salvations, these turnarounds, and I want that in my life. How do I get it? Well, the first place you start is you read the book that's there to read. 
<laughs> Don't you love how, you know, God has all these, you know, some people, they, they like all these codes, the Bible code, you know, and numerology, and, and it's kind of fun to look into that stuff a little bit, but I love, like, how God is, like, God's just like, these people, you know, Father, Son, Holy Ghost are talking. He's just got to be like, let's face it, these people aren't very smart, <laughs> okay? We got to make this simple, okay? So I'm going to, what am I going to call my book to read? I'm going to call my book to read. <laughs> okay, so now we don't speak Hebrew, but you don't have to study very deeply to see that Bible in the Hebrew means to read. That's what it's for. Huh, what's this book for? It's to read, <laughs> you know. God, God just sent, sent us, uh, you know, the gift of the scriptures from heaven. I wonder why he did that. Is there some hidden mystery down in there? Well, sure, there is, but mostly it's just to read. And to understand under the unction of the Holy Spirit. And some people said, well, I, I just can't understand the Bible. And I, I can't understand, you know, the original languages, the Hebrew and the Greek and all of that. Well, thankfully, there are other people that do. And we just have to read their stuff. I always told my... Uh, my uh, colleagues in Bible college, you know, they're in the Hebrew class. And, and I, I think it's interesting, but I just never had a strong capacity for Hebrew and Greek classes and all that. And I told him, you write the books, I'll buy your book. We'll help each other out, all right? You do the time, the research, you write the books, and I'll buy your book. And I meant it, you know? Yeah, I'll help you out, you make it easier, and you help me out. And so we can help each other out. But, but uh, I love what Smith Wigglesworth said. You know, some people said, I read the Bible in Hebrew, some read it in Greek, some in Aramaic, and the original languages. But he said, I just read it in the Holy Spirit. I just read it in the Holy Spirit. You know, there's a lot of deep stuff that we should dig deeper and find. Amen. I'm a preacher. I'm not going to dismiss that. We should be digging deeper in the Word all the time. But the main things, they're just there to read. Yes. And if you just read it in the Holy Spirit, you know, I, I would say you'd have to be a caveman to miss it, but even the caveman couldn't miss it. If you just read it, the main points are just very basic, and if you read them inspired by the Holy Spirit, you'll understand them. The other stuff, you can study deeper and learn it. But this word to read, mikra, in the, in the Hebrew, interestingly, the verb part of that, that word, the ra part, the ra part is quara, quara, ra, and that means to call. To call. God's pretty smart too, isn't he? He makes it obvious this book is the read, but then he always puts that little deep hidden secret in there. And in the verb that, that is part of that word means to call. So it's not just to read, but it's God calling us. God is calling us to the word. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I love the, you know, I love stories and illustrations to illuminate the word and all of that. But basically, more than anything, we just need the word. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The word is calling out to you. The word is alive because our God is alive and it's calling to us and if we can hear the call then all we got to do is respond yeah. the great thing about God is that when he calls you to do something he equips you to do it amen yeah. he doesn't send you on a company trip and not pick up the tab as long as you obey God and you go do what God says God picks up the tab you know, we keep using the property as an illustration, but this wasn't just something we dreamt up one night. God brought this into our hands. He called us to it. We responded. God paid it off immediately. God spoke to us to fix the shed. We've reached our limitations on certain things. So we're going to exercise our faith for funds to come in, obeying God, not dreaming something up, but obeying God. And you know what God's going to do? God's going to supply it. Because God doesn't call you to do something without equipping you. And that's so much of what the next passages of this, this uh, passage are all about. Especially when we get later in to chapter 4, which we'll do next week by the grace of God. But uh, God calls us and he equips us. The word is there to read. It's there to call us, you know, the universal call to all of us. It's calling out to us. But then... Uh, there's an individual call for us, and uh, I don't want to turn there. I'll just read it for you, but you can write it down if you need to. It's John 14, 26. Remember we talked that Paul started this passage out by saying, I beseech you, brethren. Okay, I beseech you. That was the word paracleto. Okay, coming alongside to hold your hand and to help you. Well, that's the same word as I mentioned that Jesus used in John 14, 26. 
I'm reading out of New Living Translation this time. He says, but the Father sends the paracleto, or the Holy Spirit, as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit who will teach you everything and remind you of everything that I have told you. So God doesn't just throw his book down like a memo. It's not like a company memo, you know. What's the problem with you? You didn't get the memo? I sent it out to everybody. Well, if that's through indifference or pride or rejection, that's a problem. But if you're just worried about remembering it, don't worry about that because you got the Holy Ghost of God living inside you, paraclete alongside you that's going to remember you of everything you need to know just when you need to know it you know so many times when not just in preaching but just in various circumstances where you just feel so inadequate you're just so inadequate and yet when you step out in faith in that place where you know you're supposed to be it's like god just brings you the words the words just come sometimes there's no feeling in the words Sometimes there's great emotion in the words, but it's like God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, brings the memory just what you need. Uh, I love, again, Pastor John Geisler's story. I, again, I know he won't care that I share this because he shares it all over, of when he was up north, way up north in Alaska, by the North Pole somewhere, and this, this lady walks up to him that's angry at God. He's, I think he's outside meditating or something. And this lady walks up angry at God, you know, and, and, and he, he couldn't find the words. He couldn't get any of the words. And, but he just said what the Holy Spirit brought to his heart. He didn't feel nothing. And the lady stormed away mad. And he felt like, man, I blew that encounter. That was, that was horrible. And then that night or a couple nights later, the lady walks into the crusade where he's at, gives her life to Jesus, and says, ever since you spoke to me, I haven't been able to escape this feeling, this something. <laughs> it's never been about us. See, he thought, hey, I blew the situation. I said all the wrong things. Nothing was right. And yet God used that in that lady's life to lead her to the Lord later on. God's calling. We just got to respond. That's the balance. That's how we keep it. That's how we keep it balanced. So quickly, what is God's call within the church? Now, I feel like we need to, to specialize a little bit here in this and clarifying this because the overall call of the church is to worship God, right? Amen. We're called to worship God. Nothing higher, nothing lower. We're just called to worship God. It's as simple as that. The call of the church in the world is to be a testimony of Jesus Christ, isn't it? Display his name, display his power, love people, and be a declaration of who God is through the word, through our testimony, through ministry. That's our goal in the world when we're in the world. You know, but different situations have kind of different goals. You know, my, my goal when I'm in here praying alone isn't so much to be a declaration of Jesus Christ, but I don't got to prove God to himself. <laughs> Who am I trying to prove God to? Here, I'm just here to worship. But when I'm out there, you know, I can worship, and there's nothing wrong with worshiping when you're walking down the street. I say you should do plenty of that. Nothing wrong with it. But worshiping, just praying in tongues while you walk down the street for everybody to hear, that's not necessarily changing the world, unless God specifically called you to do that. That's not really changing the world. You know, we're out there to be a declaration of power, to love on people, and we're in here to worship God. But what is it that God wants the church to do? Oh boy, this list could get long, right? Oh man, think of all the stuff that the church is supposed to do. And there's a lot of good ones. We're supposed to feed orphans and widows. We're supposed to care for the elderly. Uh, that's all stuff that's taught in the Bible. You know, we're supposed to be salt and light. There's a whole long list of what the church is, is supposed to be and what the church is supposed to do. But what is the main thing that the church is supposed to do? It love one another. That's good. But the call within the church, and it, it, it involves love. That's a great answer. The call within the church is unity, which comes through love. God doesn't call us to unity with the world. No, -uh. he says be separate. Come out. Be in the world, don't be of the world. Don't mix, you know. You mix in activity to be a testimony, but don't mix in lifestyle with the world, right? But in the church, the call is the unity. Now, he tells us that if we walk in unity within the church, that the world will see that and they'll be amazed and they'll know that we're his children because of our love for one another. That's what the word teaches. So unity within the church is a declaration to the world. But you know, if the church 
was in unity. I mean, biblical unity, when a church gets into unity, they're unstoppable. Because the last time I read this book that's calling out to all of us, it only takes two or three of us to agree on anything in Jesus' name. Yes. He's right there in the midst of us. Whoo! Unstoppable. When we come into true agreement, I'm not talking about Tolkien agreement, you know. I'm talking about when we come into true agreement. And so within the church, the word especially here in Ephesians 4, calls out to us for unity. You want to walk out resurrection power in this church? Be unified within the church. And he's going to tell us how to do that. All right? So that's what we're going to look at. He's going to tell us how to do it. It's the goal within the church to be unified. And uh, I, the book I've been reading, Practice Resurrection, or I've read it, I'm going to go back through it um, with... Uh, Eugene Peterson was the author of that. Some of this has been inspired by that book. I should mention that. But uh, he tells a story of how one day he and his wife, they're aged, they've been married many years, I guess, and they're walking through the park one day, just about their business, he and his wife taking a stroll through the park. And one day, this bike rider, this random bike rider, wheels up right next to them, and he looks at them and he says, Whoa! dude, that's amazing. And you know, they're older. They both look at him and say, what's amazing, son? He says, I've been watching you from over there and you've walked across this entire park in perfect unity of step. <laughs> you know, they, they felt that's pretty good, man. That's pretty impressive. You know, they said, well, son, we've been married 60 years and we love each other. And you know, the guy just got on his bike and ran away uh, and rode away and, 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 and Brother Peterson, Eugene Peterson, he said, he said, that was so awesome. We just walked, you know, a few inches taller that day. And, but he said, we haven't been able to do it since. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever had something that the harder you try to do it, you can't do it? I mean, there they were subconsciously with no thought of doing it, and they were walking in perfect unity. But from the minute that they tried to do it, they couldn't step together. Did you know that it's a proven scientific medical fact that when two lovers are within close proximity of each other, especially when they're touching, hugging, kissing, holding hands, just in close proximity to one another, two lovers, when they're together, within three minutes, their hearts begin to beat in synchronization. They beat in unity. Now, you could never set your mind, to, I'm going to make my heart beat with my wife's heartbeat. No, what you got to do, you just got to get together and love on one another. And as you get together and as you love on one another, your hearts, they synchronize with one another. Is that pretty cool or what? Huh? That's a proven medical fact. You can look that up. Hearts synchronize when lovers are in close proximity for a few minutes. Within three minutes or less, your heart will synchronize with the heart of your lover when you're together. Well, so what is this two-step? I'm calling it the two-step of unity within the church. Actually, as hard as unity is within the church, it's actually quite passive. Just like, you know, the couple strolled in, in unity when they weren't trying to, and just like the heart of lovers beat together when they're not trying to make it do that, th this two-step of unity within the church, though it can be complicated, is actually quite simple. It's as simple, first of all, as humbling ourselves. It's very passive. Humbling ourselves is a very passive act. Paul uses these words. He says, with all lowliness, gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love. Now, as everywhere in the book of Ephesians, we could break that down into little micro pieces. I'm not going to do that today. He's just simply saying, be humble. Be humble with one another. Prefer the other person. Give up your agenda. Love on them. Be humble. Humble yourself. Oh boy, I just said unity was simple, didn't I? And now you're looking like, this is the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. <laughs> but it's very passive. Let's just get together and let's just humble ourselves. We, you know, at, at the week before Easter, the foot washing was so wonderful. You know, uh, at the transition 
service between uh, Tom and, and uh, Josh on the Friday night. Josh brought out a pail and he washed Pastor Tom's foot at the transition. That was so touching. I mean, you know, it's, it's, you just lose it at that point. It was powerful and amazing. That, that humility, that, that's how our hearts begin to beat as one. We humble ourselves. That's what Christians do. The next thing we do is, he says, you keep your focus on the activity of the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 3. He says, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bonds of peace. Now that word endeavoring can mean to strive, but you've got to make sure you're striving for the right things. We're not striving for unification with one another. We're striving to keep what the Holy Spirit's already given us. It's the Holy Spirit's unity. He's the one that did it. And we're keeping the focus on him. And he says that this is the bonds of peace. You, you keep the unity of the spirit in the bonds of peace. Now that word bond there is, is a word that in the Greek that means ligaments of the human body. It keeps things connected. But it can also mean a bundle. So when we keep our focus on the activity of the Holy Spirit, we get the whole bundle of peace. Man, there are so, so many things. You know, when, you, when we try to love each other and when we try to walk out this Christian life, if we're not careful, we get focused on all the little details of how we're going to do this. And what happens very quick? Well, uh-oh, I wasn't, you know, I, I didn't say the right things there. I had the wrong gesture there. Oh, I should have said goodbye there. I should have said hello there. <laughs> we all play that game sometimes, right? You, you, you don't got to, remember the picture of the little, little Dutch boy sticking his finger in the dike and then another one, spring, and, you know, before long he runs out of fingers and toes? That's what it's like when we try to walk this thing out in our own power. What we need to do is keep our focus on the activity of the Holy Spirit. Let him deal with the details. And what he'll do is he'll connect us like ligaments of joints, like a bundle of peace. He'll, he'll hold things together. He'll put things together. Focus on God. Focus on the Holy Spirit and his activity. Don't focus on all the details. But what will happen, remember the context that all of this is in is the call. The scales that are balanced, God calls, we respond. I don't have to wake up every day dealing with everything and trying to fix everything about me or you. I got to wake up and I got to listen to the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit might say, hey, go over and do this today. Or I might think I hear the Holy Spirit and I'm walking over to do this and an interruption comes. <laughs> and it's one, it, if I hear the Holy Spirit, it can be one of those blessed interruptions. The best things that ever happened in my life are the things that were never on the schedule for the day. Amen? Amen? Jesus, 80% of his miracles that he worked weren't on the schedule. He would be going somewhere and a woman would touch him or you know, another one would call out to him or a blind man would be sitting by the road and Jesus just loved people and he was sensitive to the Holy Spirit so he would turn and deal with this one and this one. And, and he... You know, he was smart enough to know this, but sometimes we're not. But those, those detours, those diversions, those little things that weren't expected became some of the greatest stories we have in the Bible. We would never have so much of the ministry of Jesus' as healing if he wouldn't have had all those diversions. Believe me, the Holy Spirit has to speak to me about this all the time. All the time. And I, I'm doing my best to listen. I can't focus on every person, every detail, every place, everything. But I can listen to the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen? Amen? So can you. That's the unity of the Spirit. So you want unity among us? Humble ourselves with one another. That's step number one. And then the other step of unity is focus on the activity of the Holy Spirit. Just do what he says. Learn to recognize his voice. And uh, he'll take care of the relationships with one another if we do that, those two things. Uh, but to bring, you know, we're very different. And, and I've preached on this part before, so I'm not going to say much on this. But we always say water and oil won't mix. And with us, our personalities can be very different. A lot of us are very similar in this room because, you know, Central America, Ohio, you know, we're very similar in a lot, but there's still a lot of differences about us. A lot of things that are different. And sometimes you go places that people are very different. I have a very strong capacity 
uh, like on the mission field or like ethnic places, people love me for some reason. They always say, you're not like we expected a white guy to be. I'm like, a white guy is supposed to be away? <laughs> you know, but I get that all the, all the time. We got our perceptions and things uh, of one another. But we can be like oil and water that don't mix. But when you got two things that don't mix, you need an emulsifier. That's why when you bake, you put water in the cake mix. You put oil in the cake mix, but don't forget the eggs. Because if you don't put the eggs in, it's not going to stick together right. The eggs are an emulsifier. They bring two things together that otherwise would not mix. Let me tell you, as much as I love all of you, we wouldn't mix except for the emulsifier, which is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus, has brought us together. And he's brought us together in very intimate ways that we could never achieve on our own. So we don't have to focus on one another, fixing each other or even fixing ourselves. We need to humble ourselves before one another, and we need to focus on what Holy Spirit is doing. There's the key to unity. If we do those two things, except for haters, there might be some haters, but people will be blown away by this church. They'll be blown away. Actually, we have a lot of work to do on it, but I hear a lot of comments about the love in this church anyway when people come, that they feel, that they feel loved, you know, they feel doted on, you know, that, because people do care. But, you know, we can always get better. But, oh man, Holy Ghost is preaching. He, I know, I, you know, the, the things that God speaks to you, he's probably speaking to me a lot of those. We've got to quit trying to fix each other. Let's just humble ourselves, love each other, and focus on what Holy Spirit is doing. Amen? Amen? They always say, and again, I'm not perfect at this, but another James Dobson technique is you don't focus on what your kids accomplish. You focus on your kids' effort. Because if you focus on their effort, you encourage them to keep trying, right? Focus on what they accomplish. Well, what, are, what am I going to do bigger and better next time? So we're supposed to focus on effort. How about instead of, you know, uh, criticizing and focusing on what somebody didn't do or you know how big or small we just when we see genuine heartfelt god honoring effort we just praise those people they really gave their best they really love jesus see that that's how we bring unity now it's the